Hello and welcome to one and all. So in today's class, we'll check out the next industrial policy uh, announced by the Congress government again, the industrial policy resolution of 1980. Okay. So the previous one, the IPR of 1977, which was introduced by the Janata government, couldn't continue because the government was there only for two years. And again in 1980, the Congress government came back to power and they wanted to continue the same uh, features which they followed, which they announced in 1956, that is IPR 1956. So they, in order to do that, they had to modify the IPR, which was announced by the Congress government. So they announced a new industrial policy when they came to power in 1980. Okay, so the Congress government, which came back to power in 1980, announced a new industrial policy on 25th July. 1980 on the lines of IPR 1956. If you remember, IPR 1956 gave a major role to the public sector and also to the heavy industries. Whereas the 1977 policy announced by the uh, Janata government, which shifted the focus from heavy industries to the small scale and cottage industry. So now again, when the Congress government came back to power, again, they wanted to continue the uh, same uh, industries which they gave importance in 1956. So the main feature of IPR 1980. So the first objective is revitalization of the public sector. Because the public sector uh, already started incurring losses. Majority of the public sector units in the country has already started incurring losses. So revitalization of public sector. So something has to be done to strengthen, revital, give back, give them back, like come back to life. So something has to be done by the government to strengthen the public sector. So that was the first feature of the 1980 policy. So in order to revamp the public sector. The government decided to, so their idea is to strengthen their management and develop management cadres in the fields of finance, marketing, etc. in the for the, in the public sector undertakings. See, most of the units are collapsing because of the wrong decision makings by the man at the managerial level. So if the proper managers are elected or if the proper training facilities are given to the managers, then they will have the efficient managerial cadre in each and every public sector unit. So that's what the uh, government decided to do. That's how the government decided to revitalize the public sector by having an efficient managerial cadres in their respective units so that there will not be any wrong decision making at the managerial level. Okay, so that is the first feature. And the second uh, unique feature, what they decided is something called as economic federalism. Okay. 
So this they decided to create by. So this policy, it proposed to promote several small scale and cottage industries. as ancillary units, as ancillary units to the main industries. So they will become complementary to the main industry. So all the main industry, large industries are under the public sector. If uh, ancillary units and uh, small scale industries are established as ancillary units to the main industry, then they both will function uh, complementary to each other. So that's what they propose to do. And at the same time, they will be promoting the small scale industries also. So, so this, they designed a unique way. They propose something unique called as, it is proposed by the government on the next page to set up something called as set up a few nucleus plants. This is a, a special feature of this policy, something called as nucleus plants in each district So what are all those districts? The, industri the districts that were identified as industrially backward. So in those industrially backward districts, the government proposed to set up a nucleus plants and thereby promoting the economic federalism. Now, what is the meaning of this uh, nucleus plants? So let us assume this is one backward area, okay? Let, me, let, let us assume that this is backward area, industrially backward, backward area A. And another, we have one more this, uh, area district, okay? This is one backward district A. This is another backward district B. Like that, uh, identifically, uh, the government has identified which are all the districts which are industrially backward. So now, what is this nuclear? In each of these backward districts, the government proposed to set up a nucleus plant. Now, what is the meaning of this nucleus plant? It is nothing but several number of ancillary units, small scale and cottage units, will be established in this area. So, in this yeah, number of ancillary units. So these ancillary units, anyway, they will be supporting the main industry. So several number of small scale industries, several number of cottage industries. So all these uh, units will be established in one particular backward area. And the all these units, they will be helping each other. So they will be complementary to each other and they were over a period of time, they will be, uh, this area will develop and this area will become self-reliant. They need not do whatever the needs of this particular area, the needs of one particular industry will, will be met by the other industry. So that's why different, different varieties of small scale industries, different, different varieties of ancillary industries will be established in one particular backward area. There will be like a cluster of industries industrial units in that particular area. So they will become self-reliant and all their needs will be met within that particular uh, district itself. They need not have to depend outside. So that bigger leads to economic federalism of the each and every district. So like that, similarly, after this backward area, uh, backward district A, then again, the same uh, nucleus plants will be set up in backward district B. So nucleus plants is nothing but several, several units of ancillary small scale and cottage industries which will be established in one particular backward district. So over a period of time, they will become 
self reliance so all their needs will be met within that particular district they need not have to depend outside so over a period of time that in the, that district will become developed so that is the proposal of this uh, 1980 policy and that is the meaning of economic federalism that is they can make each and every district they have their own independent independent they will become self reliant and by that is the meaning of nucleus plants that is establishment of different different varieties of uh, small scale cottage industries etc in that particular district so that is the second feature of 1980 policy okay then the third feature is redefining the small units so they wanted to uh, change the capital limit which was introduced by the janata government in 1977 so redefining the capital limits so for the tiny units so tiny units the capital limit uh, announced by the janata government was 1 lakh so this policy the limit of investment raised from from rupees 1 lakh to It has proposed to increase to rupees 2 lakhs. And as far as the small industries are concerned, so the capital limit is increased from rupees 10 lakhs to rupees 20 lakhs. And as far as the ancillary units are concerned, it is from raised from fifteen lakhs to rupees twenty five lakhs. Okay, so there are two reasons for increasing the capital limit. One is the cost of production keeps increasing. Uh, according to the inflationary trends in the country, the cost of production will not remain the same, isn't it? The cost of production will keep on increasing. So accordingly, uh, the capital limit has to be increased. That is one reason. And the second reason is, suppose if instead of 1 lakh, if the capital limit is raised to 2 lakhs, so more and more number of units will be included in the category of tiny units, isn't it? So 1 lakh means only very few uh, units which with the capital limit of uh, 1 lakh, only they will be included in the category of tiny units. But now if the government has raised the capital limit to 2, two lakhs, so the any industry which is uh, having a capital uh, investment of more than 1 lakh, maybe 1.5 lakh, 1.75 lakh, up to 2 lakhs, so more and more number of industries will be included in the category of tiny units. In the same way, like small industries. Till now, it was only uh, industries with a capital limit of 10 lakhs were included in small industries. Now, by raising the capital limit to 20 lakhs, more number of you industries will be included in the category of small industries. And the more smaller a uh, industry is, then the more concessions the uh, government will be providing to those industries. So now, uh, more and more units will be included in the tiny units and more and more units will be getting the concessions from the government. So that is one reason. And another reason, according to the rise in the general price level, according to the rise in the cost of production, the capital limit will be periodically increased, upgraded by the government. So that is the, uh, this is the capital limit as per the 1980 policy is concerned. Okay. Then the next feature is, Promotion of rural industries. So rural industries, all those handlooms, khadi, handicrafts, all those industries have to be uh, given the paid attention by the government. Yes, handlooms, handicrafts, 
and Kadi Industries. There's a household industries. Would receive greater attention because these industries are uh, generate huge amount of employment, isn't it? So they are all labor intensive industries, and at the same time they don't require that much amount of capital also. So they generate huge amount of employment, and they are uh, they don't need that much amount of technology or capital. So if the government favors, uh, provides the, all the concessions and all the assist, assistance to these kind of industries, the rural area will develop. So employment generation will develop and in the rural area. The income of the rural people will, the general per capita income of the rural people will increase. And so that, that will lead to the development of rural areas in the country. So whatever is assistant required for these kind of industries will be simultaneously provided by the government. Okay. Then the next one is the removal of regional imbalances. So this is a co again common uh, objective announced by all the governments in their industrial policy resolutions. So in order to remove the regional imbalances, industries will be established in the backward area. So for this, the state encouraged industrial units in backward areas of the country. So all the concession will be given to those industries which are will coming forward to establish their units in the backward area in the country. Okay. And the next one, in the area of industrial sickness, so industrial uh, sick industry is the one I mentioned to you. The any unit which is continuously incurring losses, so that is the considered as a uh, sick industry. So, uh, what is the policy towards industrial sickness? To what extent the government is going to take over the sick industry? So earlier I mentioned to you public sector. Uh, not a, because I assumed the dominant position in, from 1956 onwards, all the sick units under the private sector were taken over by the uh, public sector and finally public sector became sick. So in order to avoid that, the government is not going to make the same mistake again. So only on a selective basis. So the same policy which was followed by the 1977 policy by the Janata government. So the policy towards sick units is there are one is management of sick units will be taken only in exceptional cases so that is every sick unit will not be taken over by the government. Only very, very exceptional cases, whether uh, that particular unit is extremely important for the general public. As only those kind of units will be, it is very uh, important as a, for the public interest. So only those kind of units will be taken over by the government. And another thing is potentially viable sick units will be merged with the healthy units. So in the sick, sick units also, there are two categories of sick units. Some sick units are viable sick units. Another, uh, some of the sick units are non-viable. They are not, I mean, whatever assistance you provide, you cannot uh, run that particular industry. So those kind of sick units will not be taken over by the government. So potentially viable sick units, that is there are some units if the government provides certain kind of financial assistance or in any other way, if, the, if those units are provided assistance by the government, then those units can start functioning again. 
So those kind of units will be merged with the healthy unit. That is, if there are a couple of public sector units which are running profitably, they are all considered as a healthy units. So some of the sick units will be merged with some of the healthy units of the under the public sector. Okay, so that is the um, meaning of this point. Potentially viable sick units will be merged with the healthy units. So it is easier to merge one sick unit with the healthier uh, unit because economically it is viable. So now even the Tata's recently they have announced that after taking over the Air India, which is which happens to be a sick unit, so they have merged all their other airlines of uh, Tata's, isn't it? Uh, Air Asia, Vistara, and all they have merged with it. So instead of running different different airlines separately, it is economically viable to merge all the airlines into one unit and run, and they can run profitably. So like that, uh, different different public sector units or private sector units which are not operating properly, which come under the category of sick unit, they will be merged with the other healthier units, and they will become a single entity. So that is the meaning of the second point. And then the next one is the. regulation of unauthorized excess capacity. So the meaning of this uh, excess capacity is, say for example, let us assume uh, if any industry with a plant and uh, invest, uh, plant and machinery that investment limit is let us assume 50 crores. See, we have seen the capital limit of different different industries, isn't it? Mega industries, it is more than 100 crores and large industries between 10 crores to 100 crores. So that is the uh, capacity, that is the capital limit. Suppose let us assume any industry, the capital limit, authorized capital limit is rupees 50 crores. So this is authorized limit or this is authorized capacity. So they can invest up to 50 crores, okay? So what is happening in the private sector, they want to expand their business. So they are increasing to, let us assume they are increasing the investment up to 75 crores without any uh, authorization from the government. So this is called as the unauthorized capacity. So this is excess. So that's why this is unauthorized excess capacity. So now what the government wanted to do, the government want to regularize that. So that means for instead of 50 crores, the government will allow regularize whichever the companies which are having the excess capacity that is more than the authorized investment limit. So those companies will be regularized by the government. That means they will be allowed to expand uh, to, to a certain extent. So that is the regularization of unauthorized excess capacity. But there is a limit. Maximum they can uh, expand is only up to 25% of the to total installed capacity of the company. That means what they can expand only up to the 50 crores for an additional 25%. So only to that much extent they can expand. So that is the meaning of the, this point. So that means, put it in words. So this happens mainly in the private sector because they keep expanding without any authorization from the government. So in the private sector, so there's a limit is capacity expansion. of up to 25% of installed capacity. So if it is 100 crores, up to 125 crores, they can expand. So this includes including the whatever the government has regularized. So totally ma maximum, they can expand only 25% uh, of their installed capacity. Okay, 25% of the installed capacity. So this would be automatically available. So it means what? They need not have to wait for any approval from the government if they are 
expanding up to 25% of their overall capacity. Automatically available to the overall capacity, including the regularized excess capacity. The government must have already regularized. Suppose uh, already they have expanded to 10%. Isn't it? That must have, the government has already regularized that. So now additional 15% they can expand. So totally put together, it will become 25%. Regularized excess capacity. Okay. And there is also some provision is made, some conditions are imposed on uh, companies called the FERA companies and MRTP companies. Okay. So the FERA and MRTP companies would be considered on a selective basis. Now let me explain what is the meaning of this FERA. See the full form of this for your information. The full form of FERA is Foreign Exchange Regulation Act. So this one was passed by the government in 1973. So this actually there are certain companies which require periodically they have to import certain parts, components, raw materials, technology. So like that, the nature of the companies, they have to keep on importing all these items from the other countries, from the foreign countries. So they are already using the scarce foreign exchange reserve, reserves available in the country. So now if these companies are given this automatic uh, expansion uh, limit of 25%, so they will further expand and they will be further importing all those uh, foreign components from the other countries and they will be consuming all the uh, their scarce foreign exchange resources available in the country. So uh, these companies, any company which is coming under the FERA companies, so they will be given as a, what you say, so that's why the government passed this act, Foreign Exchange Regulation Act means regulating the foreign exchange. Each and every company, they cannot use the cash foreign exchange as they wish. So they have to go through the proper procedure. The Reserve Bank of India will approve only uh, very, very important cases only. They will allow the company to import the foreign uh, components because of the scarcity of foreign exchange resources. And this foreign ex exchange, uh, the FERA companies are those companies which are having the foreign equity capital already more than 40%. So the FERA companies so those companies are called FERA companies so the FERA companies are those Who's in which already the foreign equity is more than 40%. So already they are having uh, more than 40% of the foreign equity. And on the top of it, if they are allowed to expand their business, then they will invite more and more amount of foreign equity and that will become more than 50%, more than 51%. So then what the foreign uh, entrepreneur, they will have the more voice in the management and the ownership of the company, which the government did not want to give. So already their maximum, the Congress government, remember, they wanted to give the foreign equity capital only to the extent of 49%. The remaining 51% should be in the hands of the domestic entrepreneur. So if they're already having 40%, and if these companies are expanding their business, if the government allows that automatic uh, expansion, regularize the excess capacity, then the foreign company, foreign equity capital will further increase. Okay, so that's why the government wanted to give not to every company only on a selective basis. And also another category of company is the... Uh, uh, MRTP companies. So MRTP companies, the full form is monopoly restrictive and trade practices. 
So MRTP, the full form is monopoly restrictive and trade practices. To put it very simply, there are certain companies under the private sector, they're already assuming, assuming the role of monopoly. Say like uh, some example, if they're already having 100 crores of investment, or if they're already having 25% of the market share, and still if they want to uh, expand their business, so they're all assumed like a monopoly companies. So if so, these kind of companies also, if they are allowed to expand, then uh, their role of monopoly will further increase, isn't it? So then the role of public sector will be degraded. So the government again did not want to do that. So only for these kind of companies, the government will not is not going to allow automatically this twenty five percent excess capacity. So only on a selective basis. So that is the uh, for these two companies concerned. And there is one more point here. as far as that ex, uh, excess capacity is concerned. Also, this facility is not applicable in respect of items reserved for the small scale sector, reserved for the small scale sector. So this reserved for small scale sector, so initially what the government uh, did was certain items were reserved for the small scale sector. So initially I think it was somewhere around 300 products and later the government, periodically the government kept on increasing up to somewhere around 700 to 800 products were reserved for the small scale sector. So reserved for the small scale sector means what? These uh, kind of products should be manufactured only by the small scale sector. They are not supposed to be manufactured by the large scale sector. See one thing, whatever the products that, are, that can be manufactured by the small scale sector, that can be easily manufactured by the large scale sector, but uh, at a lesser price. Because of mass production, they will be able to manufacture and sell at, at a lesser price, isn't it? So then the small scale industry will not be able to compete with the large scale industries. So what the government did, whatever the products that are manufactured by the small scale industries, small scale industries cannot manufacture all the products. So whatever commodities that are, that can be manufactured by the small scale industries, they are not supposed to be manufactured by the large scale industries. So those products were reserved for the small scale sector. So whatever you, any of these products are under coming under the category of reserved category of the small scale sector. So in those type of products, the government will not provide this automatic 25% excess capacity to the large scale industries. Okay, so that is the meaning of uh, this. So now these are all the uh, main features of 1980 policy. It has, I mean, the the conclude if you have to conclude the 1980 policy it is said that 1980 policy has a more practical approach so this policy even though was more practical in its approach like uh, strengthening the uh, public sector managerial cadre, establishing the nucleus plants by increasing the capital limit of the tiny units and all. It was more practical in its approach, but then the problem was it favored the capital intensive technique, ignoring the employment objective. So that was the uh, criticism leveled against this policy. So more practical in its approach, it favored capital intensive technique of production, that is mechanization, ignoring the employment objective. So critics point out, this is one of the major drawback of 1980. 
policy. Okay. So this is the 1980 policy. And the next major change in the industrial pattern of our country happened with the announcement of the liberalization policy announced in 1991. That is industrial policy resolution of 1991, which is one of the most important policies of the country. Apart from 1956, 1991 policy happens to be the most important policy, the turning point of industrialization in our country. So which I will explain to you in my next class. Okay. So if you find this video useful, please like, share, and also please subscribe to, the, to my channel so that you won't miss any topics. Okay. So until my next class, take care. Bye-bye.